Right now on Denver 7, we are sharing your stories. It sounded like bowling pins. I mean, it was really, it was loud. Your traditions and heritage. I want a and your impact on the community. We're always looking to improve what we can do and pass on more food to more people. Through the lens of our photojournalists. Whether it's not people believing in you and saying that you can't do something, I think it's even better when you have all the equipment and all the tools there to say, no, I'll show you that I can. A look through the stories we've shared in 2023 starts right now. Thank you so much for watching this special presentation here on Denver 7 called Through the Lens. I'm Wanye Reese. During the next hour, we are going to take you on a journey showing you the stories of our photojournalists here at Denver 7. They're typically the people that you don't see because they are always working hard behind the camera. But let me tell you, they give us a thousand percent in each and every story that they do. Let's get started here in Lakewood. Photojournalist Richard Butler first introduced us to Tanisha Howard, who owns Jumbo Sports Bar and Grill on West Colfax. The black owned bar scored great reviews on Google since opening back in 2021, but allegations like undue noise, over serving alcohol, and underage drinking suspended Jumbo's liquor license this past summer. Destroyed my business, actually. You know, it's gonna take a lot to bring it back up, but I done lost so much money. I picked through some of the, the reports. I could see what was happening, that they are being unfairly targeted, in my opinion. Lakewood Councilwoman Anita Springsteen told Denver 7 she supports Howard and her business and feels the move was a disservice to the community. Denver 7's Richard Butler did check back in with Howard to see if Jumbos was able to be back in business. She says a judge did not have strong enough evidence to revoke the liquor license, but did issue a six month probation period. Tanisha says she is quote, trying to rebuild and trying to stay in the building. She also adds she wants to get an attorney, but cannot afford one right now. Taking a look up north now in the town of Lyons, 2023 marked a decade since floodwaters ravaged that area. At the time, there were some stories of tragedy, but there also were some stories of hope. Photojournalist Drew Smith is sharing a special story with us that you may have not heard about before. It's a story about a man and his excavator. Construction can be a loud business. But for Steve McCain and his son Jared, nothing compares to the sound of September 2013. It sounded like bowling pins. I mean, it was really, it was loud. Steve had found his business in the middle of the worst flood the town of Lyons had seen for 500 years. 40 foot wall of water. That's what I call it. 40 foot wall of mad water. I was a junior in high school. Only 16 at the time, Steve's son was just beginning to work at the family business. I just got my driver's license, I think the week before the flood. So I was free roam. There would be no teenage roaming. Realizing the National Guard was still days away and that they had the only excavator in town, the McCains sprung into action. We went up to the bridge, checked it out, and it was like, wow, we're gonna need a lot more machinery to work on this. Steve decided to use his excavator to shore up the last remaining bridge in town. Time and the elements were working against him, as well as a surprise obstacle, bureaucracy. A local official tried stopping him, saying, You need a permit, and my response was, to them was, uh, you either help or get the f out of the way. For the record, City Hall was closed on account of the historic flood, but that didn't stop Steve from leaving a public comment. Showing them they were number one. And used one finger. And I liked it. That's what made me laugh. <laughs> Sam Talent was witness to Steve's heroic actions that day. He was doing his job. And without the job that they did, we'd have been in a lot more trouble. A lot more trouble. A lot more houses would have been lost because of them. They say not all heroes wear capes. But I'm not a dresser. But this dynamic duo of father and son is just one example of the historic effort the people of Lyons undertook to save their town. I'm not going to say I'm a superhero. He wouldn't accept that, but that's okay. He's been doing that for a long time in this town. He cares a great deal about the community and just doesn't like stupid people. <laughs> I got to say, it was one of the funnest times of my life. In Lyons. During the flood. I mean, super fun. Drew Smith. A lot of good camaraderie here. Denver 7.
I'm photojournalist Cameron Duckworth and I'm outside Fort Collins where I'm learning that the Cameron Peak fire is still affecting the Poudre River. In 2020, the Cameron Peak wildfire, largest wildfire in Colorado state history, most of which burned in the Poudre River watershed, the landscape was pretty severely impacted. In July of 2021, the black hollow debris flow, the power of that water was astonishing, the size of the boulders and the debris that came down. The river was just choked with sediment. It was running black as black, and it actually just suffocated fish. We lost all fish for 20 miles downstream. It was catastrophic. Stock between here and Eggers, and then come and meet us right back at this location. Ready? Today we're stocking 108,000 rainbow trout. To rebuild the fisheries uh, is a lot of work and it takes many years to do so. Today we're stocking one to two inches, so they're age zero rainbow trout. Is there any room left? Well, I fished the Poudre River. I'm a member of Rocky Mountain Flycasters and the conservation and service work they do is very important. It's important to me to protect the fishery so for as many years as I'm able, I can continue to fish up here with success. The fisheries are important, both in terms of just the overall health of the ecosystem of the Poudre River, fish are important to that, as well as providing recreational opportunities and angling. Good luck, little fishies. It's absolutely worth it. Many people celebrate the holidays with their loved ones gathered around the table eating some food. But unfortunately, millions of pounds of food go to waste each year. Denver 7 photojournalist John Henderson introduces us to a nonprofit that's looking to fill that gap. Over 40% of the food that's produced in this country is wasted. Basically, we're taking good food that would normally end up in the landfill and putting in the bellies of people that you really need it. As we grew with the services that we were providing, we ran out of space. I began to look for additional property and we found this building. Our old building was 11,000 square feet. This building is 30,000 square feet. When we load and unload our trucks, staff can close the garage doors. Now we can park all of our trucks inside, out of the elements. They're protected from any theft. We can bring kids from schools in, show them videos of what we do. We can provide them information or they can conduct their own informational sessions in, in this uh, classroom. The demand has increased from the beginning of the year to where we are today by a factor of about 65%. And it's a startling number when you stop to think about that. This year will approach providing food to close to a million people in the state of Colorado. Unfortunately, there are no days off for hunger. People that are food insecure are hungry most of the time. And that's why our task is a continuum one. We're always looking to improve what we can do and pass on more food to more people. Coming up, inspiring social change, one cup of coffee at a time. This is a learning space. You go in expecting a latte and you walk out with a lesson. How one local cafe is working to make a more accepting community for all. Plus, I believe wholeheartedly that I was born to be in this profession. I was born to be an auctioneer. We share the inspiring story of Haley Bear as she breaks barriers for women in her industry. My favorite part about Colorado? It's so beautiful! Dogs. Dogs are the best part. Seeing Dinger. Um, the mountains. I like the swimming pools in the mountains. Honestly, everything. The casual atmosphere. I like the Nuggets games. The museums. I like every single thing in Denver and Colorado and America. Everything's the best! I just love Colorado. Whether you've lived in Colorado all your life or you're somebody like me who's still relatively new to the area, there is no denying you all. We live in such a beautiful state, a state that's also home to many traditions that are connected to Western heritage, which gets me thinking about the Douglas County Fair and Rodeo that takes place every year. Photojournalist Jamie Williams Dawson takes us there to show us the great tradition they have going. This is the initial kickoff for the fair. We're gonna ride with the cows. Each year we come up to, to Castle Rock. They, their fair and rodeo is beginning 
this weekend. They kick it off with a, um, a well-known concert of, of a country music star. And then they've got a PRCA rodeo here. And of course, everything that goes on with the county fair. And to help promote that, we do a downtown trail drive with Texas Longhorn Cattle. 200 years ago, these cattle would be driven out of the Panhandle of Texas. They'd come right up through this country, right into the stockyards at Denver, or onto the railways in Cheyenne. So it's a very piece of history that we're reenacting for them. And of course, you'll be able to see the crowd loves it. It was amazing. It was full of energy, lots of people, feeling safe, feeling happy, just loving everything about it. The great thing is just seeing the community come together every year for this event. Yeah! Haley Vare was just 15 years old when she went to school to be an auctioneer. She wasn't sure if she was suited for a class full of cowboys with big belt buckles and even bigger hats. But as Denver 7 photojournalist Brad Woggett found out, she is now the international auctioneering women's champion. I believe wholeheartedly that I was born to be in this profession. I was born to be an auctioneer because everything I do is just... I walk fast, I eat fast, I talk fast, I, you know, everything I do, it's like, I'm in traffic, let's go, come on! I feel like being an auctioneer is woven into the fabric of who I am, and so I'll just be randomly, like I'll be out shopping, trying on an outfit, and I'll be like, 10, now 20, what do you get 20, I'm gonna 30. This is a male-dominated industry. Uh, Especially here where we're at in the auto industry, I think it was the first female uh, to come on and get up and sell on the mic. I never thought I would be an auction. You know, I never knew about it. 15 years old, I'm just so blessed that I got to learn about this industry, become in immersed in it and involved, and then now this is my full-time career. I'm just, I'm really grateful. Hey, from trailblazing to making a difference in your community, sometimes it can be as easy as just serving up a good old cup of joe. Denver 7 photojournalist Richard Butler takes us to the self-proclaimed activist coffee shop in Denver's Five Points neighborhood. I consider this place to be heavily community driven. But you're so beautiful. We want everyone to see how beautiful our, our people are. <laughs> um, yeah, we need to show the world. You gotta let your community know, hey, this isn't about a business, this is an us thing, right? We are the village. This is just the gathering place for the village. I saw milk latte. It's not always just about the product, right? Like Denver's full of coffee shops. But the one thing that Denver isn't full of is comfort, camaraderie, all kinds of things that make this place this place. The baristas here are just fantastic. They're so friendly. I love what they stand for. And in my opinion, it's the best coffee in town. We are very big on the cultural aspect of what we bring to Denver. This is a learning space. You go in expecting a latte and you walk out with a lesson. Mwah, we love you. Thank you. Of course. My name is Melitti Brahana Mescal. I own Whittier Cafe. Um, we've been here for 10 years. We're an African espresso bar and social justice cafe. You are in the historic Whittier neighborhood. If you know anything about this area, it was a formerly red line community. Um, so, in other words, it was all black <laughs> by, by design. I'm from Tigray, it's the northern region in Ethiopia that unfortunately is under genocide. I started the cafe out of frustration because people didn't understand like where coffee comes from and what a gift, you know, Africa has given the world. And so I wanted people to know that every day you start your day with a little bit of Africa, you know, in your cup of coffee. We do a lot of, you know, social justice advocacy and it's a meeting space for activists. That came about pretty organically, becoming the Activist Cafe. There was a young person, Jesse Hernandez, who was killed not too far from here, and there was a group that wanted to mourn their death, and they didn't have a place to meet. And so it was a big frustration. Um, you know, I reached out and said, hey, you can, you can meet here, come to Whittier Cafe, and coffee's on, coffee is on us all day. So that was like sort of the beginnings of our like activist story, I guess. If you think of like, what is an activist? It's someone who's, fighting to bring, you know, social change and um, uplift people who, you know, whose voices are unheard. 577, go ahead and uh, finish that out for me. Thank you very much. The biggest thing that people don't know is maybe sometimes how difficult it is, you know, to be in this space. Um, just given the history of the community and being a red line community and being a black business and then that has survived that. Not that I want to leave, but just that pressure of like, okay, so if I were, you know, to close my business, then what? You know, what happens? Because there's been such a loss. 
Um, so sometimes that pressure, I think, actually it makes me emotional. <laughs> but um, that's hard thought, you know. Yeah. So sometimes you feel like, um, sometimes I feel like I'm, <laughs> I can't leave. You know, I can't do anything different. Okay. Woo, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> faith will always be there. This shop is a big driving force of that faith. Everything happened so organically that I didn't realize it in the moment, but um, suddenly we became this place that people really love and really adore. One of my favorite, I guess, quotes from a customer was, the coffee is great, but I really come for the love. I'm like, that's really nice. <laughs> in communities, there is a lot of culture, but one way of representing that could be through art. Coming up, we hear from both a professional artist and those in training as they work together to beautify one Denver school. Plus, not all art uses paint, how other creatives have come to master their talents. Colorado is home to many artists of many different mediums, just like what you'll see out here at the Sculpture Park in beautiful Denver. Whether it's parks like this, museums, or even some artwork you're seeing in your own community, it represents the diverse and beauty of our great state. Denver 7's photojournalist Scott Blessing introduces us to an artist who used some kids to put the finishing touches on a magnificent work of art. No, no, it's all freehanded for sure. It takes a lot of practice. I know nowadays, you know, you have technology on your side. Before, it was just straight freehand. You messed up, you had to have plenty of paint on hand to make sure you, you were able to fix it. My name is uh, Rafael Herrera. We are at Asbury Elementary School in Denver, Colorado. And we are putting together a legacy project for the fifth graders. It's the Asbury Eagles. It's, it's the school's mascot. What I wanted to do was create something that was going to use their school colors, invoke pride within the neighborhood with this wall and, and something that kind of stands out in the neighborhood as well. They asked me to create something that was going to lead into their newer projects, which they're gonna be extending further down on this wall. So this was gonna be the, the intro to that. Keep your drafts with you so that you can go off of it. Blue mixing into purple, green mixing into blue, uh, yellow mixing into green, so yeah. that's really cool. We're in fifth grade. Yeah. We've been um, making a mural, so we had to find out what the mural was gonna be, yeah. and then we voted on it. The quilt, puzzle piece, and like a vine thing. Good job. Little structure. Exactly, little strokes, perfect. We had like two uh, drafts on paper and then the, we got feedback for the second draft from Mr. Raphael. You just added texture there. We were trying to go for concrete instead of abstract, I mean abstract instead of concrete. So like people wouldn't know what we were doing. We're teaching these kids to be able to express themselves. It is my passion. Good now. job. It gives them a sense of ownership. I learned how to like be more abstract and kind of like Mason, make it be exactly how you want it. Are you gonna clean up the whole red or just little spots? Good job. Mr. Raphael. Do you need help? Mr. Raphael helped us. He He's really sweet. If more schools did something like this, it would be able to give some of those kids that outlet that, that they didn't know they had. Not all works of art require a canvas of sorts necessarily. For some, all they need is just the raw materials and their imaginations to create something beautiful, much like these artists that Scott Blessing shows us. Right now I'm using this cheese grater tool to sand down everything. Begin with the 10 foot by 10 foot by 12 foot block. That is pretty much as hard as a rock. I couldn't even draw it on a piece of paper. I couldn't. My name's Keith Martin. I'm at the Breckenridge International Snow Sculpting Festival. I started in 2006 on the Germany team, and from that day on, I've been hooked. We are sculpting a Uller sculpture, or the God of Winter, here at the festival. We get to defy gravity with the things that we're carving. We get to amaze people. 
and the emotions that it evokes when you see a piece so large and so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I realized how special what we do is that we can really make people get away from whatever they're at for a moment and feel what we're trying to achieve. I use a base of tempera paint to kind of work from dark to light on a, a lot of my images. And so it's actually tempera paint cut with water, so it's very thin. It's able to wash away the same way as you'll wash away the chalk. But it allows for more of that pigment pop. My name is Eric Matelski, and we are here at the Denver Chalk Art Festival. I love all the um, creativity. So much talent. One of my favorite parts about the festival is the fact that everything's temporary. The interaction of having that many people here, that's, that's that many people that are just kind of living in a moment. Do you see any foxes? I got my two children, Brooklyn and Michael. Take your time, do those small circles for me. Honestly, I believe it is in the genes. He was an artist for a long time, but now he's in high school, took different interests with sports and everything. But she's like, Dad, I want to be a mural artist just like you. And I was like, all right, well, let's get you out there. Let's get you nice and gritty so you can see what it's about. <laughs> you can express yourself so deeply with artwork of all kinds, you know, and I think it's important that kids have an outlet like that. I bring I probably five chainsaws, five different chainsaws, and they're just normal chainsaws. They're not specialty except for the bars. We have uh, specialty bars that we custom order. They basically prevent uh, kickback, so it's not as dangerous for us to stick bars into tight corners and things. My name is Matt Owensworth. I'm in Frederick, Colorado, and I'm at Chainsaws and Chuck Wagon. It is a carving competition. Where carvers come from all over the United States and internationally, and uh, we have a great time making art out of large pieces of wood. So they're pretty amazing. They're good artists. Usually we start out with a large chainsaw and you whack it into the general form that you want. We get smaller and smaller chainsaws until we get to the final finished piece. It's really great because uh, it requires my entire focus. So in that way it's completely relaxing because I uh, don't think about problems I have. Even when I have hard times in my life, I like to carve. Up next, 200 acres to honor our service men and women. We hear from one veteran who works behind the scenes at Fort Logan National Cemetery to make sure all is maintained. Plus, the history behind the Denver Police Memorial Wall and how one man's legacy paved the way for others' lives to be remembered. Welcome back to this special presentation of Through the Lens, I'm Wanye Reese. The motto to protect and serve goes even further than just law enforcement. It also applies to canines who put their lives on the line. Denver 7's photojournalist Jamie Williams Dawson attended this year's Heroes with Paws. It's a fundraiser event that focuses on helping pay for bulletproof vests, harnesses, and leashes for canines. At this event alone, more than 35 canines were honored for their work in the community. These dogs are going after the people who are preying on the public and are victimizing people, and these dogs are used to go locate them and find them and get them off the street so the public can be safer. There might be a, a misconception that these dogs are um, they just go out and bite people and they're not friendly, but that's that's not the case at all. They, they have a good on-off switch. We can take them around the public and they can just be friendly around children, kids, and, and uh, as soon as you give them the command when it's time to work, these dogs turn it on. Since the Denver Police Department was founded, sadly, dozens of law enforcement members have lost their lives. This memorial behind me helps pay tribute to those men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice. Denver 7 photojournalist Scott Blessing introduces us to a man who helped inspire this tribute that you see standing behind me. Today we remember him as we dedicate this street sign as a small token of our appreciation. 104 years ago today, at this time, Officer Klein had been killed. Although many years have passed since his unfortunate line of duty death, and has been many years for us to learn of his actions, we remember. We remember him and we remember that he made the ultimate sacrifice. 
My name is Michael Hess. I'm the president of the Denver Police Museum. We are undertaking a project through the museum to honor our 77 fallen Denver police heroes. When the department was founded in 1859, to the present day, we've lost 77 officers. When I started, it was a list of names on a granite wall. But as I've become more involved in the project, you know, through with our research on ancestry, you meet their families, you go to where they lived, you read their stories, you become emotionally attached. And I've become emotionally attached to Officer Klein. George Klein is that he was a very devoted young officer. He was a family that uh, immigrated from Russia at, at a young age. The Jewish community here was quite small at, in the late 19th century, but it grew exponentially in the first decades of the 20th century. The Eastern European immigrants settled mostly on the west side. And kind of taken hold and their cultures kind of drove those communities. And it was unusual for Jews to go into policing at the time. He was a very grateful American, having come from Russia, and I'm assuming that one of the motivations for him to become a policeman was his appreciation for his adapted country and patriotism. Being a member of the Jewish community and being a police officer in Denver at that time was very difficult. That was the period where the Klan was coming to power. Confident that he uh, faced some challenges on that side. By 1919, he's in charge of the bootleg squad. Prohibition was re repealed in 1933. Within that 20 year window, uh, that was one of the primary focuses of the Denver Police Department. Which is really the toughest job on the department and uh, all reports are that he carried himself. There was a lot of opportunity for graft. Mob tried to buy off officers. In some cases, they were successful in that. He was not one that could be bought. He's the most threatened long before this incident occurred. Uh, one unfortunate incident, he was the head and I, I think the target of organized crime for a couple of years before this happened. Accidentally shot a member of the Italian community running out the door of one of the soda shops that he was investigating. So interestingly enough, after this tragedy occurred, he quit carrying a gun, which I find to be, you know, if there's any time he probably needed it because he was receiving a lot of threats, he stopped carrying a gun. His wife was frightened from the day that he joined the police force and begged him many times, kind of had a premonition, I guess I would say, that something would end in tragedy. A couple months later, August 29th, 19th, 1919, while he was arriving home after a shift, entering his home, gunman arose out of the bushes and shot him. Probably a revenge crime. His wife said that she, every night, you know, would wait to hear him come home. He died in her arms, and he told her, you know, they got me, dearie. The importance of these signs is that 104 years later, we're standing at that location and we're still saying those officers' names. And the people that perpetrated this crime are forgotten. Thousands of service members have been laid to rest out here at Fort Logan National Cemetery in Denver. This property is more than 200 acres, so as you can imagine, it takes a whole lot of work to maintain. Denver 7 photojournalist Scott Blessing introduces us to a man who is working behind the scenes and takes a lot of pride in his job because of a connection that he has. My name is Ashanti Black and I am the ground work leader. I'm at Fort Logan National Cemetery. This is the first job I've ever had that I couldn't wait to get up and go to work. My wife gets them, why don't you take the day off? For what? <laughs> For what? I enjoy making sure the veterans who have served this country, that they're interred properly and their family are re respected at the grave site. Give me great pleasure because I too am a veteran. Hey. It's a privilege and an honor to be here and take care of the veteran that we inter here. Denver 7 is a proud sponsor of an event that honors those who lost their lives while fighting for our country. It's called the Boulder Boulder. Photojournalist John Henderson actually ran the race himself. 
And while running the race, he got a chance to speak with some runners about how they felt while they were going along the route. He's my second cousin. He just passed away uh, this spring. He was in the Army and uh, uh, yeah, just wanted to, to honor his service. My daughter is running in honor of her uncle who was in the Army and I served for 22 years myself. I'm just so grateful for all the veterans who serve our country, those who are serving now and who have given their lives for our country, for our freedom. Because uh, we, we get so lost in uh, it's just a weekend for a three-day weekend for picnics and we need to remember the sacrifices that our, that our men and women in uniform have, uh, have done for us. It's important to remember that. Keeping Colorado's spirit alive, we take a look at how one exhibit is showcasing one of the state's most significant industries, mining, plus how you can learn firsthand yourself. And next, preserving Colorado's spirit of the West with a customized look, we introduce you to a professional who continues to make cowboy hats the old fashioned way. Preserving Colorado's culture and history, let's be honest you all, it is no easy task, but there are so many people who are working to do it each and every single day. Denver 7 photojournalists Ethan Carlson and Scott Blessing are introducing us to some people who are doing exactly that. Let's take a look. I've always wanted to build hats for the everyday person. The first step that we'll do is we'll take a, a raw body. We're gonna get it pretty warm. You think about a lot of different things like the weather and how the hat's going to hold up and where it's going to be. It's fun because everything is truly custom. From the shape to how you build it to the steps that you take when you build it. I believe that it's a tool, you know. It's, it should hold up in snow, rain, sun. I try to make uh, cowboy hats for cowboys. You know, I've always taken a lot of pride in somebody that wears a hat every day when they tell you that's a good hat. That's what I'm after. I always daydream a lot about their life and what they're doing, you know. The miles they'll see on horseback in the country and things like that, and just know that something that I made's with them. What I like about Colorado is people wear all different shapes and styles here. That's what's neat about a custom shop is you're getting exactly what you want. We're the ones who had the cowboys that's our history and so I don't take that lightly. I try to carry on the Western tradition with everything that I build. I'll build hats for everybody and do that, but the guy who saves his money and is really appreciative of it, that's where I take a lot of pride. Preserving history is important, but history tends to memorialize the winners and the people who finance things. But, you know, really it's being accomplished by people working. It's such a picturesque basin. When I first came here, I was just struck by what a magnificent site it was. We're at the North London Mill site on Mosquito Pass. It's the highest open mountain pass in North America. Hops out at 13,800 feet. I'm Jeff Crane. I'm executive co-director of North London Mill Preservation Inc. I'm Kate McCoy, and I am the other executive co-director. Our mission is to finance, preserve the historic buildings of the North London Mill site. London Mountain is right here, and it is full of mining tunnels. Around 1873, they discovered the ore loads. And around 1881, a spur of the railroad came right up here. They hadn't built very much by that time, but 1883, they built the office, they built a bunkhouse. This mill was built in 1893. The ore here is really complicated. It's hard to get the gold out of it. And it started out as a stamp mill. So basically, it just had these big stamps that just crushed the rock up into really fine powder. Then it was put on these tables with chemicals 
like mercury and stuff like that to separate out the gold from the rock. And that was pretty inefficient. They were constantly coming up with new milling techniques. It was changed into a cyanide plant, which included some stamps, but it changed the chemical processes. Highly polluting, <laughs> um, a little bit more efficient. So the heyday of this place really wasn't early on. I mean, it was kind of slow and they went out of business and they moved operations over to the south side, abandoned this side for a while. And then in the 1930s, these two brothers with the last name Briscoe came from the east. They were car salesmen. They invested heavily in this place. And there's a photograph from 1935 of a whole bunch of buildings here. And they had a lease for two years, 35 to 37, and then their lease was up. The whole place was liquidated from the London Mining Company around 1939. It was in relatively good shape because it was relatively well built. This building was built for the wealthy investors from the East Coast and mine managers and their families. We're trying to be as true as we can to the original layout and original materials and look and feel and use as much of reclaimed material as we can. Kind of brings together everything that I've ever been interested in. It's a kind of an art project. The North London Mill is a, is a work of sculpture, architecture. Because it's a historic site and because we were interested in preserving the historic buildings here, there's money available. And the State Historic Fund in Colorado is really amazing at providing funding for really worthy projects all over the state. In order to get the grants and do the things to make this project work, we had to do a whole bunch of other stuff. One of the things was to get this site landmarked, nominate the property as a Park County landmark. What started as the idea of having a backcountry hut here evolved into a, a much broader vision. This is a beloved place for people who grew up in Park County, especially Alma Fair Play Breckenridge. People um, our age have been coming here since they were kids. Not big, not high, like large scale, but having concerts in the space that we're standing here, something we would like to do with acoustic music of different varieties. To me, it embodies Colorado's history, its origins, its past, and then its present and finding sustainable recreation as the demand for that grows. How can we grow to accommodate that without negatively impacting the environment? I think this museum talks about a great topic that's underappreciated by, honestly, the entire world. People don't necessarily recognize how important mining is to the environment, and they don't realize that the car they drive in or the spoon they ate cereal with this morning all comes from mined minerals. My name is Jordan Bennett, and I'm the curator at the National Mining Hall of Fame and Museum in Leadville, Colorado. It has over 60 exhibits here at the museum, five floors that you can explore at your whim, and we have over 22,000 objects here. We are in our newest temporary exhibit called Leadville's Thirst for Gold. I like to say that people came to Leadville for gold, but they stayed for silver. So there was an initial gold rush that happened in the 1860s, but the gold petered out pretty quickly. The feature objects for this exhibit is actually the illustrated newspapers that you can see lining the walls. So at the time when these prints were made, illustrated newspapers were in their infancy. So this was one of the first times that print and pictures were put together. This also provided the public, especially the illiterate public, a great opportunity to learn about the news without, being, without having to read the text that's associated with the images. And those all date from 1879 and 1880, and it talks about the founding of Leadville, the expansion of the businesses to support the growing mining industry, and then the mines and smelters that were located here. Leadville's Thirst for Gold is actually gonna be open for two years, so it'll be open till June 2025, so there's plenty of time to come and see it. I'm photojournalist Sam MacArthur, and today I'd like to talk to you about a cube. But not just any cube, this cube. A cube that will challenge not only your mind, but also your dexterity. The Rubik's Cube. We know it well. A cube with six sides and six colors. The goal? To get each side the same color. 
A fun puzzle for some, but for others, it's a sport all about speed. First ever Rocky Mountain Championship. The judge will lift that cover and start the stopwatch. You do your solve, you take as long as you need to go as fast as you can. Then once you're done, you drop the cue. That's why today at the Colorado Convention Center, over 300 speed cubers had an opportunity to compete in the first championship Colorado has ever had. You get nervous. You just want to keep trying to get better and better. Really all my free time, I have a cube within like six feet of me. For competitors like Ramos, he says it's all about the community. This is such a big deal. We have a online Discord server with a lot of people from the whole Rockies region. And now all those people are able to be here together. Ramos is not only a competitor, he's one of the organizers who helped make this championship happen. A long dream is to eventually have U.S. Nationals in Colorado. But until then, Ramos says he's ecstatic about the success of the event today, and it's all for the love of the cube. It's cool to like go from being a little kid a part of the community to now being in the community and helping it grow for even more people. I think of like breaking your records. Solving it, like having fun. I think back to like all the friends I've made through cubing, all the things you can do with it. Sam MacArthur, Denver 7. Rubik's Cube's competition requires a level of dexterity, but out here at a skate park, you need some balance and coordination, which seem to come natural for one Denver man. Photojournalist Scott Blessing introduces us to John Barron, who took part in Tony Hawk's Skate Park Hero Contest this year. Barron says he's been skateboarding for 25 years, despite him being blind. It's the freedom that most people probably get when they're driving, something that I never really got to have. When I was born, I was born with a rod cone dystrophy. What that means is that I have uh, less rods and cones in my eyes than everybody else was born with. Light perception, color perception, uh, those things are really jacked up. I want every blind kid throughout the world to have the opportunity to become just like every other athlete who's had their successes. Barron made it to the quarterfinals of Tony Hawk's Skate Park Hero Contest. He unfortunately did not bring home the prize, but we're still wishing him a huge congratulations for placing in the top five. Not all sports take place in a field, a court, or even a place like this, a skate park. Here's a look at some more athletes who are sharing their thrill for sports. I'm Matt Fry, and we're here at Orange Skies, Fort Morgan, Colorado, getting ready to do a skydive. When you leave the house, you're like, oh, do I have my phone, wallet, keys? Okay, we're good. Same thing on a skydive. You're like, oh, three ring, three ring, handle, 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 altimeter, you're just checking everything without even thinking about it. All done, ready to jump. Skydiving is kind of an escape, and yet at the same time, an opportunity to focus. When you leave the plane, there's so much sensation and uh, the views, the feelings, the noise that uh, everything else in life just disappears. In August, I traveled to the Czech Republic to represent the U.S. in speed skydiving. At Worlds, we took team, bronze in team speed. Speed skydiving, pretty much what it sounds like, you're measuring who can go the fastest, and that's measuring your vertical fall rate. It's cool to represent our country on the world stage. You'll never look back. I have yet to ever meet someone who regretted trying to skydive. I'm in no rush, dude. Ah! This is my afternoon. Hold on the hand put your bottom in the middle. I'm just glad you wanted to spirit with me. Being a Colorado native, it, it, it's important to me to be able to um, pass on some of those skills and activities that we enjoy in our pastime. Keep your weight even, buddy. First time snowboarding? Yes. What do you think? Uh, fun, but very tricky. Why is that? Because you have to learn how to keep your balance. <laughs> Not bad. Ruby Hill Park, uh, snowboarding, sledding, just enjoying the snow day, you know. I'm a college student at MSU Denver, and uh, I had class today, but, you know, they canceled it, so here I am. Dude, it's a really fun hill, though. Get out of the way, boy! This is the, the best sledding hill in Denver, probably. I mean, I can't think of any better ones. And the mountains can be expensive, too, so coming here, you know, perfecting your, your snowboarding skills and, That's you know, just getting some a, some tubes and having fun with the family. It's always a good day. Nice job, dude. A good day indeed. 
As we near the end of this holiday special, it would not be complete if we did not take the time to recognize our photojournalists who work behind the camera each and every day. So here's a look at all of our Denver 7 photojournalists, many of which had a hand in telling all of these stories that you heard in the last hour and all throughout the year. On behalf of the entire team here at Denver 7, we want to thank you for watching this special presentation of Through the Lens. We hope that you have a very happy holidays with your loved ones and family.